All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Lecture 9, the final lecture of the Building Planet series. Thanks an awful lot for joining tonight. This one, we're discussing what makes a planet habitable. But first, let's quickly review last lecture, which was plate tectonics and atmospheres. So plate tectonics and atmospheres. Early in Earth history, it looks as if there are multiple working hypotheses for making blobby, sluggish plate tectonics very early on. And now plate uh, tectonics and its attendant volcanism and mountain building creates a carbon cycle where the atmosphere is replenished and then the carbon is drawn down via reaction with new rocks. And finally, there may be some plate tectonics on Venus, but none on Mars or Mercury. And so today in the last lecture of this series, let's talk about what makes a planet habitable. One of the biggest questions uh, of all time is, are we alone in the universe? We'll look at some critical steps on that road. What is life anyway? And what does it require? And how can we find those conditions on other planets? What period of our solar system history does this concern? Well, all of it. <laughs> I'll start by talking a bit about what we understand about life. It's only what we can understand about life that allows us to begin to try to locate habitable places, that is places where life might exist. Turns out this is a complex and a difficult question. Let's start by looking at what we have so far discovered about the extreme conditions under which life can live. First, let's get oriented to this figure. On the horizontal axis uh, down at the bottom gives the pH, that is the acidity or the base of the material or the environment. If you look along the top, I've listed some familiar materials to calibrate us to use this scale. On the top left is battery acid with a pH of one up through rain, which is somewhat acidic uh, and blood just on the base side of neutral. By the way, there are um, kind of folk medicines that talk about changing the pH of your blood for your own health. And it turns out that really does not happen. Say my doctor friends, it really stays right there. Uh, and then all the way up to bleach at 12.5, super basic. Then on the vertical axis, the temperature here is in Fahrenheit and Celsius, Celsius in parentheses given on the right. But over on the left, again, I put some familiar temperature conditions from the coldest day recorded on earth that's off the scale up through the boiling uh, point of water at one atmosphere up here. Uh, the rose colored regions in this graph show the range of conditions for certain earth locations. Conditions in black smokers, the hot water conduits in the oceanic floor near mid-ocean ridges, they can have liquid water at temperatures above 100 C or 212 F because the pressures are high. And see that green star right in the middle at the top? Um, these are the living conditions of microbes that have been found. There's one that lives at 120 C above the boiling point of water at one atmosphere. And now notice the other green stars. Way on the left, a microbe that lives at acid conditions worse than battery acid. People have discovered life everywhere we've looked at it, even under conditions that was them. And before I move any further on this figure, I want to um, acknowledge Everett Schott, my colleague um, at ASU, because it was his figure that I originally modified into this um, way back a number of years ago before I even met him. And so uh, now he's still in additional, in additional incarnations. And so these, these wonderful microbes that live at these crazy environments also have uh, great names. Here, um, these are some microbes uh, that live at very high temperatures. In, in, in fact, uh, Geogemma barosi is the new proper name for the strain 121 that you see at the top of the figure. But I love Pyrococcus furiosus. Uh, that is a name suited to a microbe living at high temperature. And there are, of course, other kinds of difficult conditions that life lives in too. These two, uh, Dinococcus radiodurans and Thermococcus gamma tolerans, live in high radiation environments. They've even been found living on the fuel cells in nuclear reactors. And so considering that life lives everywhere we've looked for it under conditions that we ourselves could not live, what is the one thing that all these life forms have in common? Well, it's water. Water is one of the very few things that all life we've found so far requires. Water, carbon and other elements and a source for energy. That's about it. And the energy can be many things. Uh, don't be distracted by photosynthesis, as Everett Schock says. In hot smokers on the ocean floor, for example, microbes can reduce the element sulfur for energy. They don't need sunlight. So here in this talk, we're gonna focus on water and we're gonna assume 
that uh, on any planet, the other elements and some source of energy will be found. So first I wanna talk about how common water is on planets and I'll start with how our earth got its water. Recall that the earth and all rocky planets are created by sequential accretionary impacts of smaller rocky bodies. And to cut to the chase, we have every reason to believe that the Earth's water was delivered by this process and not by later impacts. The Earth was born wet. For a long time, people asserted that the Earth had to have been born completely dry because it was born hot, and therefore it could only get water by later impacts of comets and things like that, that we know to be wet in our kind of earthbound human perspective. Um, that really does not seem to be the case. There's chemical evidence for the assertion that the Earth was born wet. Uh, and so here it is. As we know, most elements have several isotopes, that is forms of the element that have different weights. And it turns out that different solar system bodies have different ratios of isotopes. And these isotopic ratios can act as fingerprints. Along the bottom axis of this uh, graph right down here is D to H, that is the deuterium to hydrogen ratio. Deuterium is heavy hydrogen. And it's more prevalent in some comets, like these over here at the high end of the axis, than it is um, in, in, in the Sun and Jupiter, which are way down at the, at the low end. And Earth lives someplace in between. Some people have thought that Earth was formed dry, as I said, and that later cometary impacts could only, only they could account for the water on the surface. So certainly no comets measured for a long time could match the Earth's D to H. And so that begin to feel far-fetched. Um, and then this comet, 104P Hartley, right here, was discovered with pretty Earth-like D to H. However, this graph, of course, has a second axis, this vertical axis, which is the ratio of nitrogen isotopes. Here, comets are entirely different from the Earth. All the comets are up at the high end. If comets had delivered Earth's water, they would also have changed Earth's nitrogen, and they did not. And comets consist of many ices and a lot of organic material, and so many elements can be compared. As an example, uh, noble gas composition on the Earth uh, limit cometary contributions to 1% or less. If we had more than that amount of cometary contributions, we couldn't have the noble gas compositions that we have right now on this Earth. So Earth's water seems to come from the same material that seems to have built the whole planet. And that is the class of meteorites called enstatite chondrites. Here's a lovely picture of the Pilospora enstatite chondrite that I took at the University of Alberta about a year ago. How do enstatite chondrites carry water to the earth? This looks like a nice solid rock with bits of shiny metal in it. It's not made of water or ice. And in fact, these rocky building blocks don't bring water in the form of ice, but instead as part of their solid minerals. There are minerals that contain water as part of their building blocks and that water is liberated when the mineral is heated or melted. Two examples of minerals that hold water as a part of their crystal structures, but then release it upon heating or melting are chlorite and serpentinite, and there are many, many more. So how much water can these minerals add to the bulk composition of an enstatite chondrite, or for that matter, to the earth? Can there possibly be enough water in that solid rock that I just showed you to make a wet earth? Well, let's look. This is the graph content of many kinds of meteorites, some of which may have been left over from the material that, 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 uh, that built the Earth. So here on the horizontal axis is carbon from zero to just 0.4 weight percent, so less than a half of a percent of the bulk composition of the meteorite. And on the vertical axis is water from zero to 0.7, so just under one weight percent of the bulk meteorite. And all of these dots are different meteorites. The data is from a paper, Jurosevich, 1990. And right here are enstatite chondrites, um, one of the ones I was just talking about. Uh, some of them have other you know, values than this. There's one down here that's lower value. It's an enstatite chondrite. Um, but those are all candidates to be the material that built the Earth. Now, if you run that bulk material through our magma ocean solidification codes, you imagine that you made the Earth from enstatite chondrites, they were melted completely. They made a magma ocean stage, which I talked about in an earlier lecture. That magma ocean then solidified, trapping some of the water into the mantle of the earth and releasing others of it up into the steam atmosphere that was first created by the solidification of our earth right after the moon forming impact. 
then eventually that steam cools and it collapses onto the surface to form a liquid water ocean. Well, if all of that water from something with say a half of a weight percent of water in it to begin with, if all of that water that was expelled as steam collapses into a water ocean, that water ocean would be 30 kilometers deep over the entire earth. So more of an ocean than we even have right now. If you had just 0.1 of a percent of water in this rocky material that built the earth, when that steam atmosphere collapsed, it would create a seven kilometer deep magma ocean. Uh, sorry, water ocean. Uh, I, I, sorry, I misspoke. It would create a five kilometer deep water ocean that would cover the surface of the earth. Uh, and so very, very deep amounts of water that come out of this rocky material without any need for additions. This has an important implication. This means that it's quite likely that any given rocky planet anywhere in the universe may have started with enough water to have oceans. We already know that virtually every star has planets. And now we know that most every rocky planet probably had some period of time when it was habitable, that is when it had liquid water. And so that's the big take home here. Rocky planets everywhere are probably born wet. They may well be born wet. Later additions certainly happened. The Earth has been hit by many things since the time of its magma ocean, including comets that brought water, including meteorites, continues to the present day. But they're not necessary to make a planet wet and therefore habitable. It's a really, really important distinction. You don't have to rely on a stochastic process later. And so that is a very good starting point for looking for life on rocky planets. But how can we know whether a given planet still has liquid water? This is my favorite cartoon by John Lomberg. Scientists talk about a habitable zone around a star. Each star gives, us its, gives off its own flux of energy and that energy strikes its planets. The closer the planet is to the star, the more of the star's energy strikes it. People then calculate what's called an effective temperature. That is the expected surface temperature of a planet at a given distance from any given type of star. That effective temperature if that effective temperature would allow liquid water on its surface, the planet is called in the habitable zone. But that calculation also needs to take into consideration the composition of the planet's atmosphere. Does the planet have a lot of greenhouse gases to stop, trap the star's heat? Or is the atmosphere thin, allowing energy to seep away? And what about internal heat from the planet? There is a lot to even calculating surface temperature. Well, here is an example of habitable zone calculation. The horizontal axis here is simply the distance from the star in astronomical units. If you look up at the center of the top, you can see the Earth plotted at one astronomical unit away from our sun. The vertical axis is stellar mass. And here we're looking at stars the size of our sun at the top and then smaller than our sun as you go down that vertical axis. And the habitable zone is shown as a blue streak. The inside edge next to the star is the limit where water can be retained in liquid form before it is blasted off as steam and lost into space. And the outer edge is how far liquid water can be maintained under greenhouse conditions before it's just too cold and it all freezes. This is work led by Jim Casting, a top atmospheric scientist. You can see Mars hanging out at the very edge of habitability and we'll return to that in a moment. Below our solar system, you'll see a number of exoplanets listed. Some are discoveries of the Kepler mission. At the bottom are a couple of planets in the Gliese 581 system discovered in 2007, early on in exoplanet work by Paul Butler and Steve. Gliese 581 is about 20 light years from the Earth, and it seems to have planets in the habitable zone. The discovery of more and more planets apparently within the habitable zone is a scientific thrill of just the last decade. The first confirmed exoplanet was just in 1992, and by 2010, there were about 600 exoplanets known. And now just 10 years later, over 4,300 have been discovered. But do any harbor life? Well, none that we found so far, right? Just to be completely clear, no one has found life off of the earth yet. There are at least 20 or perhaps as many as 40 exoplanets that are thought to be habitable, but we really don't know. We don't know the compositions of their atmospheres or the events of their evolution as planets because habitability is temporal. It's not just chemical and spatial. Habitability can develop and exist, and then it can be lost. So let's look a little further within our own solar system. This is the water phase diagram. That is a diagram that shows under what conditions water is a liquid or a gas or a solid. The vertical axis uh, labeled on the right is pressure. 
Uh, if you're used to atmospheres instead of bars, a bar and an atmosphere are very close to the same quantity, only differing by about 1%. So the Earth's surface pressure is about one bar. The horizontal axis shown at the bottom is temperature in Celsius. You can see the Earth in the middle, in green. That's uh, the Earth's surface conditions. At the top of Mount Everest, the atmospheric pressure can be about a third of what it is at sea level, and those high mountain peaks give the thick left part of the Earth region. In the previous habitability slide, we were just talking about planets heated by their sun. But what about icy moons heated by gravitational flexing of their planet, that is by tidal heating? Uh, one such example is Europa, a moon of Jupiter. And you can see Europa's ocean plotted here in dark blue. Europa's ocean is a great place to look for extraterrestrial life. And in fact, the Europa Clipper mission will be going soon to check for habitability. And we hope that sometime in the next decades we'll send a lander. Mars now, Mars is smaller than the Earth and therefore it has lower gravity, it has far less atmosphere and so its surface pressure is lower. Its atmosphere, largely carbon dioxide, freezes out in the winter causing atmospheric pressure to drop. That's how much freezes out, its atmosphere literally freezes onto the ground. But Mars's surface can have temperature and pressure conditions allowing liquid water just a little bit. Venus, now look at Venus over on the right, there's the rub. Venus and Earth should be the same. They're the same size, they're neighbors in the solar system, and yet Venus's surface conditions are more different from the Earth's than are Mars. What's the difference? It's composition. It's Venus's dense greenhouse atmosphere, and possibly even it's slightly being nearer to the sun might have really made a difference. This difference really points out how hard it is to know even if liquid water is possible on an exoplanet. So much of planetary surface conditions depend upon atmospheric composition. So now back to life. As we've just seen, habitability depends upon distance to the star, bulk composition, age of the planet, history of the planet, and life depends upon water, certain elements, and energy. So the question about Venus, are we too late? Was it habitable? Is it now in fact inhabited? Could it be inhabited now? In its distant past, Venus may have had oceans. Now its surface is a baking acidic desert. But it's plausible that life could have lived, could now live in its clouds. This opens the question, where else should we look for habitability in life beyond the surface? Does, in fact, the liquid water have to be on the surface? Isn't liquid water perhaps even more likely at some depth in the solid planet? Here are photos of ice layers in cliff faces on Mars. Though we know there was flowing water on Mars in the past, we're still searching for liquid groundwater on Mars today. It does look like there's liquid water under the polar caps, but maybe there's liquid groundwater at a little greater depth where it's warmer and it's really hard for us to see. And wouldn't that be an amazing place to look for microbes? So let me ask another question. What's the most likely form of water, of life? What's the most likely form of life that we would find? Judging from the history of the earth and from the logic of simplicity at the beginning, developing the complexity, then microorganisms are the most likely form of life. So I'd argue the most likely life on rocky planets is microorganisms living under the surface. Exciting, but very hard to detect. And so here's a summary of today's talk, what is a habitable planet? Liquid water appears to be the key requirement for life, every kind of life that we know. Rocky planets are born wet, which is great news for habitability. Keep assured, but there are a lot of places to look, not just places that are close enough to their star, but moons and also under surfaces where things could be warmer. There are a lot of options and niches out in the solar system, atmospheres, clouds, particles. On rocky planets, however, microorganisms living underground may be the very most likely kind of life.